Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'd like to ask the clerk to announce the meeting and call the roll. Roll call. McKiernan? Here. Mugia? Here. Maddox? Kane? Markley? Here. Walters? Here. Philbrook? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. Holland? Here. All right. Our invocation tonight is being given by me. So I ask you to please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good and gracious God, as we come into this holiday season, uh, we ask that you keep all of us mindful of those who are less fortunate. A Merry Christmas is not insured, and for many to have a Merry Christmas, it takes those of us who are able to help and lend a helping hand, whether it's through our churches, our community organizations, however we can to reach those who are less fortunate. We ask a prayer for the school children as they take a break for a few weeks and of course for their parents. But Lord, we ask that you will guide our community that we might be mindful always of your work amongst us. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, I'd like to ask Ms. Cobbins if there are any revisions to tonight's agenda. There are no revisions, Mr. Mayor. All right, that brings us to our first item on the mayor's agenda. We have three separate presentations. The first is a team from Kansas University. Mr. Bach, I'd like to point out this is from Kansas University. Um, we'd ask uh, the KU to step forward at this time and present. Please introduce yourself as you come forward. Hi, I'm Matt Kleinman. I am a professor of architecture at the University of Kansas, and I'm actually here with, with a few of my students. Two of them are sitting up here, and I'll introduce everyone later. Um, but there's about a handful more that are bringing models in from their cars out in the cold. So um, we have a presentation to share with you. Um, I, I recognize a few familiar faces, but this semester, uh, Commissioner Ann McGarry has been really a great advocate for us. Um, these students are in a course called Architecture 381 designing sustainable futures. And it's about sustainability, but it's really about community engagement and community empowerment. Um, it's finding ways for design to support communities. So you're gonna start to see a, a parade of models come in, but we'll, we'll talk about what those are for in a second. Um, but really it's a chance for these students, they're in a program that's not a traditional architecture program. They don't have a studio. This is kind of their first attempt at designing spaces for people. And um, I'm just gonna briefly kind of take you through their semester through slideshow and afterwards there'll be displays and models and boards that we can talk about after. Um, but the semester started as a design process where we were meeting with Hugo Cabrera and Anne and the members of the Argentine Neighborhood Development Association. Um, we were fortunate enough to have site visits um, near the Walmart space down in Metropolitan and uh, specifically the students and keyed in on uh, two underpasses underneath Highway 69 as an area for an opportunity for design. They were looking at complete streets. They were looking at some of the public works and infrastructure. Um, but they were also looking at ways to provide spaces for communities to interact. Um, so this is all their work, by the way, which you're seeing. Um, throughout the semester, they made uh, visits to the site. They, they recorded observations. There's a methodology that we were working with as almost like a research methodology, looking at the activities in the environment, the interactions, the different objects and the users of the spaces, and then using that within the classroom setting where these guys were designing for it. Um, so they would notice things like uh, where sidewalk infrastructure might not be um, adequate. They were looking at ways to take that and respond to it with design. Um, so the physical models you see up here were built as a, a way to have kind of a tangible um, interface with the, the community. Um, so the process of visiting the site, taking measurements, making the models in a digital format, and then actually cutting them with a laser was something that all these students did for the very first time. Um, Following that, they were able to uh, take these models and start to present design concepts. So they early on had professors from the School of Architecture give them advice and suggestions. They had uh, ANDA, including uh, Commissioner McGuera, uh, visit with them about it. And then later on, they were able to present to the Argentine Neighborhood Association. Um, so the design concepts were all themed and different themes emerged, but uh, the, the real benefit was that they were able to have a dialogue about their process and about about what these spaces might become. Um, so they were envisioning a sustainable future. Um, this was the first group's board. 
Um, and there were three groups of four students each, and you see them filtering in, and I'll, I'll ask them to stand here once we're done. Um, but this one was about creating a capsule of space using old railroad ties, linking it to the history of the community. Um, another group looked at uh, education and sustainability in a way to, to demonstrate spaces. And the third one looked at, uh, this was about creating a safe, walkable space for school children and lighting it up so that it was accessible and well lit uh, at all times of the day. So that was the first half of our semester. That ended in October. And we presented that to the ANDA, and they came back and said, we want to have you guys present to the Neighborhood Association, and then we want you to come back and present to you all here today. So um, I'm, I'm doing the abbreviated format. They just had their final review earlier today, so you guys are praying for both the students and the parents, but also pray for the professors, because now we get to <laughs> take a little bit of time to breathe. But these guys did an incredible job, and what they did is they turned it on its head. Where architects typically are afraid to sometimes talk to the community, we're sometimes worried about what people might say, these guys took that head on, and they created tools and frameworks to engage the community. So one group here today came up and said, we want to do a community mapping exercise, and they created a map that was interactive. At the Neighborhood Association meeting, over 40 residents showed up, and they were able to participate into looking at where things might emerge that they want to respond to, whether it's new crosswalks and sidewalks, places to have public amenities, places to have lighting solutions, places to have environmental improvements. Um, they were able to have a dialogue and interface with the map. Um, so specific locations stood out. Um, another group looked at a quantitative metric, basically looking at the numbers. So they were asking questions like, what do you like? And what is, what is your favorite part? And they were able to get numbers from that. So it's evidence-based. It's evidence-based um, community engagement supporting certain design decisions. Um, so one of the favorite parts of Argentine was a new South Branch Library in Emerson Park. Things that could be improved upon was general park improvements and more restaurants. So it comes from the community and provides them an opportunity to have a voice in what they see happening in their community. And one of the more interesting ones these guys came up with is they had a opportunity to uh, give Monopoly money, a uh, million dollars to each person that attended, and the Monopoly money was um, placed in envelopes as kind of a blind, uh, if you were public works, what would you do? So the number one uh, vote was safety, um, finding ways to improve safety with the, the finances. And this is all kind of a, a, a loose quantitative analysis. Um, and then the third group looked at documentation. So really finding ways to invite people to have their own voice. So for those of you that weren't able to be there, maybe you can get a sense of the stories that they heard from people that were actually uh, present at the association. So people were asked, what does my community mean to me? Uh, and they'd say things like family, friends, fun, fellowship, and enjoyment. So we were trying to allow people to have a part in that. Um, and, and talking about the stories and the history of the community and making all of this resonate um, as part of the design. So a little bit in conclusion, these guys had two different projects this semester. The first one was the, the design of the underpasses. And the second one was to really ask the community to, to have a feedback where their comments would be uh, hopefully going forward something to, to be regarded and, and thought about and, and certainly it's an, an opportunity for these students to learn about what successful community engagement means within design but I think more importantly this course is framed as what's called service learning. It's an opportunity for University of Kansas architecture students and, and students in general to serve a community's need. Um, in this case it was trying to find ways to, to successfully integrate design with public interest um, and looking at these opportunities as a way to, to move forward. So um, I'll ask my students to stand um, we have Mo, Kevin, Leticia, uh, Marley, and Lucinda, and Chris, and Jack. So uh, these guys did all the work that you saw. This is all their work. This is their semester, and this is their final by being here. So um, I'll, I'll say this to you guys. Thank you. You did a wonderful job. I appreciate the hard work. So thank you, guys. Um, I, I, I realize I, I ran through that really fast. Um, I have a hard copy, at least one, that I can pass around for you guys, and I have a digital copy of this, and I'll be able to, uh, if anyone would like an additional copy, I'd be happy to provide to, to anyone that really would like to see it. They've also done these amazing models that we referenced earlier. Um, they're pretty incredible. You can take the roof off the highway and look underneath and see where their ideas came from. So um, I don't know if, if there's something you guys would like to, to ask these guys or ask myself or, or you later on. I think uh, somebody mentioned um, having these on display somewhere here. Um, but 
uh, we, we really appreciate your guys' hospitality and, and willingness to work with us um, as students and as a university in architecture, um, and we're excited to be here. So. Well, we'd love to put these on display in our lobby for people coming in and to have the documentation there so people can review it and just give it, make it open to the public and, and so people can see some of the work that you've done. So however long we're able to do that, we'd be glad to uh, display that. I think that, would be, I think that would be great. Commissioner Merguia. Well, that's, <laughs> Sorry. I don't know, that's a big change, <laughs> yeah, that's Mr. Right. McKiernan. It's pretty dangerous. Um, Mr. Kleiman, it's great to see you again. Um, we were lucky enough to have a previous semester's worth of students do some work that's very similar to this on Central Avenue, and we very much appreciated the engagement of those students. You know, since I taught at KU for 15 years, there's nothing better than oral finals, right? So I'm going to throw out a couple of questions to the students. And the teacher is I thought we would just have some real fun tonight. Oh, no. And there's no right answer to these. I'm curious just to get your perspective on this. I would love to hear from anyone um, what was the most unexpected or the most impactful thing, the thing that had the biggest impact on you as you went through this. You all come to it with your frames of reference, with your histories of your neighborhoods and your schools and your communities. What was the most unexpected thing that you learned or encountered in this experience? Anybody can just step up to the microphone and tell me. There's no right answer. But there is extra credit being given by the professor. <laughs> There you Here we go. go. Yay. Thank you, ma'am. It's very brave. <laughs> okay. Um, your name, so your name, and your name for the record, okay. please. Oh, my name is Letitia Lee. Thank you. Senior at the University of Kansas. And Letitia, aren't you originally from Kansas City, Kansas? I am. I am from Kansas City, there Kansas. Welcome, welcome home. <laughs> Thanks. Um, for me, the most impactful thing that we did this semester was actually at the community engagement event um, it gave us a chance to not only just interact with the community members but it let us listen to you know what they were more most passionate about um, it's one thing for architects and designers to design what they want and how they feel it should interact in the community but it's all about how the community will absorb it how they will receive the information so that was a big deal for us to get their feedback um, to kind of see what they were most interested in Thank you so much. And you actually, uh, the rest of your classmates now owe you something because you actually answered my second question, which was, how will this impact your professional work in the future? So thanks for that. Mr. Kleiman, I'd just like to thank you again because I think this is truly an example of very powerful learning. And service learning is something that I think we should value much more in the future. So thank you and thank your students. Uh, be, be, you're going to close us out, is that right? Yeah. Um, Commissioner Walters, did you, <laughs> which, did you go to KU Architect School? Yes, I did. <laughs> so see, this, let that be a warning to all of you. You could end up here if you're not careful <laughs> with your career. So right. I thought we should give you a shout out for a, that's right. All right, Commissioner Maria. Thanks, Mayor. I just want to tell the students also, thank you very much. It was great to get to know you. I had a great time with you in the neighborhood. Um, your ideas were absolutely amazing. I have to tell you, when I first did this project, this is the first time I've ever done a project with a, a group of students. So I was very honest with them. And when I went to see their final presentation, I thought, oh, they'll probably be good. They were amazing. I was shocked. I didn't even, I didn't even really know how to react to it. And it wasn't just one in particular. All three of them were amazing. So I saved tonight um, to tell all of you this. I was able to secure a funder that is willing to pay to have this work done. And the community just needs to decide which model they want to see um, implemented. So in fairness to all of you, because I really mean this, that all of them were absolutely fabulous. Even the community had a difficult time um, picking between them what they had decided in casual conversation is that we would take bits and pieces of each model so you will get to see um, your work actually come to fruition um, so I'm very excited about that so thanks a lot um, Matt it was great to meet you and and to work with you um, I think that's all I had so thanks very much
Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all very much. And if I can ask um, Matt and your students before you leave tonight, um, I'd like to ask if you, we could get a have a picture of you all, um, uh, and Mr. Banks would take that picture with you. But um, if before you leave, if you can gather for a photo, that would be terrific. Thank you. All right. That's our first exciting presentation. We have two more, um, but I want to. Uh, I want to preface this conversation next with the police department um, doing work with safety first, courtesy always, and the presentations to the schools. This work um, was initiated um, by Commissioner Townsend um, coming out of the issue with Ferguson, Missouri, an immediate question of what can we do on the local level to ensure the safety of our community and the relationship with the community and the police. What, what concrete steps can we take moving forward? Um, obviously, the work we have with the community policing has been a decades-long initiative that we've been doing to work on that. There are a lot of different initiatives that we can do as a community. But these are some very practical steps of not only training the police officers, but training our public about what we can do. So as this presentation comes forward, I want to thank Commissioner Townsend uh, for your initiative and in bringing these forward. And um, I think this is a step in the right direction. So if you have any comments now or later, um, I'll call on you at that time. But I want to turn this over to the police um, so we can get started. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Commissioners, Mr. Bach, others. Um, that was very inspiring from KU. Go Jayhawks. Uh, <laughs> So the first half of tonight's presentation from the PD, uh, I'm going to introduce you to a campaign. And this is a branding campaign that is one of many pieces of the future, I think, of this police department. And so I'll spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes kind of introducing. I won't really get into the weeds on this, but I'll give you enough information that hopefully it will excite you for really what's to come. So before I move on to the next slide, I just want to tell you that this is a branding campaign and it is designed to demonstrate the link between our operational effectiveness and community trust. And this piece of tonight's presentation, this actually began before Ferguson. This is something that the police department, and I have to give credit where credit's due, uh, it really came from the mayor and your push to embed the idea of customer service into all things UG uh, and I think you very um, clearly challenged all of us as uh, employees of the unified government to find ways to amplify the customer service piece in order to improve our uh, connected our connection with the community and that's what we started working on before Ferguson and obviously and I'm actually proud to say that uh, under Chief Hansen this is something that um, you know, we're proud of that we were working on this before this was thrust upon the nation as a front burner issue in August. So, Mayor, we took your comments on customer service and we really kind of distilled that down to what we felt was a working uh, practical term for us and that was courtesy. And this campaign has three overarching objectives objectives. One is to enhance our overall effectiveness. That's number one. That's the name of the game. We want to be as effective as we can as a police department. Number two, we want to maximize community trust and perceived legitimacy. And the third objective is to distinguish ourselves as an agency that is known for service and courtesy. So here are the guiding principles that you see up on the screen now. Um, and these are important, that the essence of all police work is defined by face-to-face -face interactions, period. Everything else that we do is secondary. Citizen cooperation is the most important element in preventing and solving crime, and our effectiveness is wholly dependent on our perceived legitimacy. And I will just tell you, as in my assignment as chief of detectives, that the, we solve crime one way and one way only, and that's citizen cooperation. That's victims coming forward, that's witnesses, that's suspects, 
uh, that's jurors who support the criminal justice system. And on any given day, our officers come into contact with up to 1,000 people. So think about that. There are 1,000 individual face-to-face -face contacts. And the premise behind this campaign is that every contact matters, every single one of them, and we cannot afford to squander even one of those. And so we have to make the most of each one. So here's the methodology behind the campaign, and there is a real practical component that you'll see here on the next slide. Uh, we want to train and encourage officers to display outward courtesy in every situation in order to shape the experience. And here's what I mean by shape the experience. Contact with the police for most people is a very big deal. And in many cases, it's a raw, visceral thing to have contact with the police. And even under the best of circumstances, but you know, if it happens to involve a car stop or a disturbance, uh, you know, it, things can ratchet up very quickly. And to the officer who's trained, you know, this is just another day on the job. But to that person who's being contacted and in some cases detained or controlled by the officer, that's a really raw, visceral thing to have happened to anybody. And for better or worse, people will always remember that contact. Uh, they'll remember that and they will share that word of mouth, social media, with everybody they know. And if it was um, very positive, people will know that. And if it was negative in their perception, a lot of people will know that. And that's what we have to work against. So we're going to employ some various survey mechanisms to provide officers with individualized feedback from citizens about how they are perceived. And this is not, this is very different than what most police departments do in the United States. And that is where they measure the community's reaction and perceptions of the agency. We're moving beyond that. We're getting down into the weeds and we're saying, we want to know from an officer perspective, how is that person thought of by the public that they serve? And so we're going to use the survey results to coach, to encourage and to recognize our officers. So here's the first step. We give out a victim information brochure to all victims of crimes that we deal with in this city. And this is just the front cover here on the left of the screen. And uh, this is a, you know, a tri-fold brochure and it has some useful information in there. But look at that blue box. How did I do? I'm a professional law enforcement officer. I care about the community I serve. I stand for integrity, fairness, and courtesy. And inv I invite you to rate the service that I provided you today. And we provide three options for that person to rate them. They can go to the website, and because we are technology, we're forward thinking in, our, in technology terms, uh, if you want to scan this QR code with your smartphone, it'll take you right to our survey site. Or you can uh, send in a, a detachable mail piece, um, which also comes with that mailer. And I will tell you that this is up live right now. We haven't publicized this. We will bring this live next month in January. And so you're, I welcome you to go to the website um, and uh, see what it looks like. It's five very simple questions about the service and the courtesy that that officer provided. And we intend to give that feedback directly to the officer and letting him or her know, this is what people are saying about you. Not what they're saying about the department. This is how they perceive you. And that person's, the officer's supervisors will also get that feedback. It'll be uh, a direct line, direct feedback from the citizens to the officers. And if you go to the website now, it's only in English. However, when it goes live next month, we've already got it translated. We just haven't posted it on the website. This will be in Spanish as well. So the victim brochure was kind of a logical starting point, but we're looking for other opportunities to uh, invite the citizens to give us the feedback. Uh, the mailer is obviously an option there, and I've showed you what the back side of it looks like. Victim Services sends out a letter to all crime victims. Uh, within a week after the crime, we want to incorporate that. Uh, we use e-ticketing when we issue citations to people out in the field, and I'd like to figure out a way that we can have that blue box, how did I do, or something to that, uh, something similar to that, print out with their ticket to invite that. 
And we've also talked about, you know, putting something on the reverse side of all of our business cards. How did I do? You know, I invite you to rate me and the service that I gave you today. And we intend to recognize those officers. You know, right now in our annual awards ceremony, we don't have anything, we don't recognize officers for exceptional courtesy because we don't really have the, the data to kind of support that. We've got a lot of good officers, they do a lot of good work, but we intend to kind of establish what I will loosely characterize as courtesy ratings for our officers. And I'm not exactly sure, I know the Mayor is a big data, uh, a fan of big data, and we want to be in the big data business when it comes to understanding how our officers uh, are doing their jobs and how they are perceived to be doing their jobs. And we want to recognize that. So I envision maybe in our annual awards ceremony at the end of uh, next year, to me, one of the big awards that we should give out is the highest, the officer with the highest courtesy rating if you will, you know, ought to get a top award, and we really want to promote that. Um, you know, to me, I will tell you, having been here for 25 years, uh, this is, you know, this is for the most part an urban police department, and I think that there's something that is pleasantly ironic and bold about an urban police department that says that we want to brand ourselves on courtesy, and that's how we want to be known. And so we're going to build on this first step until the idea is more, you know, tightly woven into our culture. We've got a lot to do. And um, we look forward to coming back sometime soon, maybe early part of next year, with some positive results. And we're open to suggestions. And so uh, any ideas you have how we can, you know, build on this idea of branding our organization on courtesy, uh, you know, we really want to hear that. And until then, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, um, and that's all I have. Com Commissioner Markley. So one thing that I think is interesting about this concept is that when you do a survey, not only do you get back feedback, but the person who's taking the survey gets a certain impression just by the fact that you're surveying them. So I think what will be interesting is to see, you know, most of the time when we have encounters with the police it's not necessarily positive so you, you get pulled over getting pulled over not very nice I think we can all agree um, but when you ask the the person who was pulled over to distinguish between the getting pulled over which wasn't very nice and the actual individual officer I think that you're 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 making them think about things in a different way and you're saying okay you got pulled over that was bad but was the officer themselves nice and I think when you ask the person to sort of make that distinction in their mind, we're just, we're having an impact just by asking that question, I think. And I think that's a really good impact to have by sort of individualizing our officers as community members and as people who are trying to serve the community. So I appreciate that side of it as well. And I'd just like to respond to that a little bit. There is a very uh, intentional um, purpose behind asking of the question to begin with. We want to send the message. We want our citizens to see that upfront in bold letters, how did I do? We, because we know that that does send an important message. And, and to your point, Commissioner, I, I mentioned that we want the officers, we're gonna train the officers to shape the experience. And what that means is that regardless of what the incident was, if it was just, uh, you know, hi, I bumped into somebody at a local quick trip, or if it was a car stop, if it was an arrest, or whatever it was, we want to train the officers to help shape that person's memory of that incident so that as the officer disengages and goes about his or her job the idea of an outward intentional um, act or statement to help shape that person's memory of that contact we think will be very valuable Commissioner Merguia thanks mayor this is really excellent work I think it's a fantastic presentation and it looks like um, it's going to have a great impact on how we as a police department are perceived by the general pub public and I agree with Commissioner Markley's comments um, police the police department policemen in general and women um, tend to take a lot more criticism than other um, departments um, it's kind of the expression that uh, nobody likes a cop until they need one um, and that's unfortunate for the profession so I think I hope this will really change that because I think we have some great law enforcement officers 
I would only have one suggestion. I would hope that you would link these survey results to the officer's evaluation if that's possible. Thank you, Commissioner. We have talked about that, and uh, we will definitely take that under consideration. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, um, Assistant Chief Davenport, and to all those who worked on this program. As Commissioner Markley said, I think this is a great way for citizens, one, to feel empowered about giving feedback, and two, to allow them to individualize their experience with not just the police, right. but the particular officer who came to their aid or stopped them or whatever, and, and be able to distinguish what was done from how it was done. Uh, again, could you again say when this will actually go into effect and how those how did I do surveys be made available? For instance, let's say I'm stopped, heaven forbid, for a traffic <laughs> uh, kerfluffle or whatever. Would the officer at that time, you know, give me a how am I doing car <laughs> survey or would I have to go online to do that or will there be a combination of both? Thank you, Commissioner. Well, right now the first step in the process is the victim information brochure. And this is given out to anybody that calls the police and makes an offense report for some uh, reason or another. But we do uh, want to incorporate this as broadly as possible so that at every practical uh, juncture in our contacts with citizens that they're given that opportunity. As far as when it will start, uh, you know, it's pretty much ready to go now. There are a few things we have to do as far as adding the Spanish or putting up the translation, you know, by the end of January. Um, the ticketing piece, our idea at this point is to find a way to put that how did I do verbiage on the e-ticket itself so that as the ticket prints out and the person is handed their ticket uh, that lists the charge and the fine and so forth, that the survey is on there as well. So there, I, I'm sure that we're gonna find other ways that we can invite that type of feedback. And uh, so we're gonna be looking for all of the opportunities that we can find. And it's our opinion that the more the better because it's all part of the big data, you know, uh, benefits that we know will flow from this, we hope. Great. Well, I think I, I like the idea of it being written on the ticket um, because that guarantees the person gets it. Um, if I had a bad experience giving out a ticket, I might be reluctant to add a brochure to the ticket uh, to say, please uh, let me know how I did if the person was particularly cantankerous. One of the things you'll learn as you pull this big data is every officer, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population that's going to give you a negative rating no matter what you do and as you gather that data you'll be able to filter that you know it's going to take that initial input before you can gauge you know five or ten percent of every interaction is going to be perceived as negative regardless and then it's going to be the delta on that for the officers who are doing a good job in terms of of the change so i think that building it into whatever documents we give you know, it, it's going to serve as a good model, I think, for our community, too, for our you know, code enforcement. I mean, that's a very unpopular group to have come visit you as well. Um, and when they send a ticket, um, having that feedback loop on there is very good. Um, and every opportunity we have as a unified government to get feedback on how we're doing in interactions with people, we want that, and we want to tabulate that. So I, I, commend, your, uh, I commend your work on this, and I, I look forward to your moving that on to the tickets and the violations that you issue as well because i think that's going to be very helpful agreed thank you mayor all right thank you. Um, our final presentation tonight is item number three is a presentation of the police department's video which captures the types of discussions the school resource officers have on a weekly ba uh, basis with teenagers in our community good evening mayor commissioners mr bach uh, Commissioner Townsend asked us uh, to create an informational type video regarding car stops. So we tried to see what kind of talent we had in the PD because we've never done this before. Uh, so this is our first run at it. So we, what we did was we captured the interaction of our school resource officers with the students about and let them ask questions of things that were 
concerning to them or that they want to know about. So I got some people I want to introduce tonight that, that helped put this together. We got Captain Lawson, who's the commander of the community policing unit. We got Officer Cameron Morgan. Uh, we didn't know that he was a videographer. He did a great job on this. I think you'll agree that the quality is outstanding. We got Officer Elaine Moore, who's one of our school resource officers. She works at Schlegel, and she will introduce the students that are with her. Good evening. Good evening. I have the best students in the world, I must say that. All right. Ray Monique Brown, she's a senior. I have Wim Wallace Jr., he's a senior. I have Justin Adams, he's a sophomore. And I have the <laughs> best kid, Matthew Strauss, and he's a sophomore. <laughs> And it hurts me that these two are seniors because I'm going to lose them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, if we could, if we could play the video now. they do certain things on traffic stops don't worry you get to ask the questions we allowed eight students from fl schlegel high school to ask officers anything they wanted to know about traffic stops can we talk about the flashlight yeah <laughs> why do you guys this is the first thing that happens you always flash it in their face why like there are many reasons why officers use a flashlight me and myself i use a flashlight as a opportunity to um light up the car in front of me so I can see everything in front of me and see what I'm what I'm approaching. Um, sometimes I use it for a diversion technique so I can get you focused somewhere where I can kind of examine and see what else in the car. But there's many reasons why officers use the flashlight. So when you see someone like that who has a mental disability on the street, how do you handle that? Because of course they're not like, you know, me who can obviously know right for wrong. What do you do? First thing we don't want to do is treat them like they're criminals. Because what we have to understand is sometimes people are sick and need different types of assistance. The police department has a CIT team and we have other instruments that we can utilize as officers. And we have officers that are trained to actually come out on calls if we have someone that we have come in contact with that maybe we can assist. You know how when someone gets pulled over and they don't have their seat butt on and they try to hurry and put it on? Can y'all see that? <laughs> Yeah, we can see it, and it's obvious when you're trying to slide your seatbelt on or, or take the seatbelt off. It's best to just wear it at all times because strapping it on saves life. Strapping it on saves life. Strapping it on saves life. A lot of female officers try to like be mean. Like, are they trying to like prove that they're tough? Being a female officer in a male dominant workforce is difficult. But what you have to do is be confident, one, in yourself, two, you got the exact same training as the male officers did. Three, you don't have to look like a male officer if you're a police officer that happens to be female. We are the same. If I go on a call with a male officer, I hope that I have done enough with my training where people will trust me. I'm just wondering if we're not doing nothing wrong, why you stop it? And we know we know he, he checked uh, the tag and stuff, so we ain't got no warrants tonight. But why you why would you stop us? Though? There's many reasons why you can be stopped by the police. Uh, safety for one. Um, maybe that vehicle matches the description. Uh, you guys have matched the description or something that has happened. Them to give you information to keep you safe as well. There's 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 many reasons why officers stop vehicles. When you're just driving down the road and you just see this one disrespectful person in the car that flips you off or like does something absurd or stupid, like how do you feel or how do you react to that? When I get flipped off, guys, uh, I've had enough training and enough time on the streets now that it, I don't take it personally anymore. I mean, what are you going to do? Some people just don't like the police for any reason at all, but we're good people. There's no reason to be doing that in the first place. As you're sitting in your car and you're waiting for the dispatch to come, now if they decide to run out or then you decide to drive away. 
There was a time in my career that I would take it personal. Now, I don't take it personal because I think they're running from the idea of who I am. Uh, I'm a law enforcement officer and there's something in their past or they might be going through something where they don't want to have contact with me, so I don't take it personal anymore. Where am I going to get the word that you don't have The first thing you need to do when you hear lights or sirens is pull over to the right and wait. We can see you if you haven't had your seatbelt on. So if you don't have it on, don't try to pull on it because it just makes us laugh. Put your hands on the steering wheel at 10 and 2. No fidgeting, no moving around. Wait for the officer to approach your vehicle. Wait for the officer's instructions. If you don't have your driver's license or your registration or your insurance close to you, advise the officer, I need to reach over and get my driver's license. If you need to reach into your pocket, just do it slowly and let the officer know. Be respectful on a car stop. Officers have discretion, and sometimes a vehicle stop can lead to a warning. Just always be advised to wear your seatbelt. Take this as a warning, all right? I'm not gonna give you a ticket this time. I'm gonna try to stick the seatbelt on, but you wear your seatbelt, keep it safe. Sure. can produce a video since we've got uh, some talent we didn't know we had uh, we're going to continue building on this uh, we'll have a I, I see several different types of videos coming out information video on what you can expect on a car stop make them a little bit shorter this one ran about six to seven minutes try and get them down to three to five post them on our website on YouTube uh, post some on how to take care of warrants if you have warrants uh, what can you do if you get uh, if you're a victim of a an assault and you have a suspect name is all how we can help you work through that and get a summons issue to somebody so we're gonna build on the, the idea of creating informational videos and making them available to the public uh, one thing that we've we've done also is we've taken the ACLU's uh, the little handout that you were given it contains information about car stops what you can expect what you have to do don't have to do we also have this in Spanish we're gonna make these available at headquarters we'll probably use this type of brochure to help frame the car stop video so that we're putting out information that's easy to understand so and is there a plan to take these to the high schools the these pamphlets the brochures and the videos one of the things we had hoped is to get this into all nine of our high schools the the taking to the high schools we're willing to we're willing to play them anywhere uh, you know the schools are uh, we have to talk to them and make sure that they're receptive to the idea of taking up the students time to play it Currently, with the Junior Police Academy, we can distribute these in the high schools real easily through our SROs. So we'll be doing that immediately. We can also play the video during the Junior Police Academy, but those students are already getting that interaction. I'm not sure how receptive the school would be to play in the video, like at a school assembly if they have one. Uh, I know they're very protective of the students' time. Well, I spoke with each of the superintendents in all of our school districts in Wyandotte County. They have all said they're open to it and ready to receive the information from the police department and encouraged it so I think that we have the green light to go ahead and organize that and maybe one of the things they wanted to do was maybe work with their SROs in terms of presenting them in a smaller group because I had suggested doing it at an all-school assembly and their concern was all school assemblies are a deal <laughs> and trying to get an all-school assembly to watch a video can be challenging uh, but if they could do it in smaller homeroom sections and have the video to pass around to the homeroom and have every homeroom um, that they meet at least once a week with to give them a brochure in the homeroom, show the video to them, and have that homeroom teacher or the SRO facilitate the conversation. So the school superintendents are very supportive, and I think in light of the national events, really are anxious to get this information in the students' hands, and this video would be outstanding for all of our schools to do. And of course, we love that Schlegel's leading the way in getting the word out. 
<laughs> Commissioner Markley. I was just going to say, you know, I know everybody probably likes to watch our meetings like three or four times in a row on UGTV, but perhaps some of that time could be spent playing some of these informational videos. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll put those on UGTV. That is a great idea. And this great school district has, this, has one as well. Ms. Crystal Watson from District 500 School Board is here. Um, but I think using all the ch public channels we have to get the word out, also Marianne Flunder from the Community College Board is here. It'd be great to get this in front of our Community College students as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I want a pretty aggressive rollout to all of our high schools to make sure it's in the hands of the homerooms. Not a problem. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I cannot thank all of those uh, who were involved in making tonight's presentations um, a reality. And I have to start with the mayor who on the day after Ferguson, when I reached out to him, was more than willing to do whatever it took to make possible, first of all, the August, I believe it was 28th special session when Chief Hansen, along with um, Assistant Chief Ziegler, uh, now soon to be new Chief Ziegler, um, Assistant Chief Davenport, several of the other officers came and talked about what is uh, the training of the KCKPD KCK Police Department. We talked about use of force. We talked about the appeal process. Knowledge is power, and hopefully it will be a positive, uh, it will have a positive impact on the citizens of Wyandotte County and also our police who are seeing that the citizens want to be made aware of their rights and their responsibilities. And the second and third part of getting a video out so that there are tangible takeaways. I'm not sure how many uh, high school students we have, but I think it's imperative that this become a part of their curriculum. Uh, high school students are the ones who are getting into um, situations where they're out of eyesight of parents or guardians. They're going to be naturally uh, in cars or, or just away from um, uh, parental supervision. And to be, in, to be stopped or have an encounter with a police officer can be daunting experience and a bit unnerving for an adult, let alone our, our young people. For them to have a tool set to use to know how to respond in a respectful manner, manner while also being apprised of their rights is only going to have a positive, I think, uh, result for both the citizen who can go home at night uh, and save to their family and our police officers who deserve and, and expect to go home to their loved ones as well. So uh, I hope that this tape, this video, which is less than six minutes, will be shown in all of the high schools at least once a year to all of the students there. That will have a trickle-down effect. It will make uh, the encounters of our citizens and our young people more positive with the police. It will also dovetail with the mayor's initiative to increase the number of minorities in our police department and fire department because the encounters will be more positive. Uh, so I appreciate the efforts of all of the uh, staff of the police department. Um, I just want to call these people's names out starting with the uh, uh, Chief Hansen, uh, Assistant Chief, soon to be new Chief Ziegler, uh, Assistant Chief Davenport, uh, all the officers who supported the Chief uh, in the August presentation, uh, the officers in the video, Officer Williams, Officer Thorne, Officer Moore, um, our in house Steven Spielberg, Officer Morgan. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and all of the Slagle students, uh, could you stand one more time, please, and uh, receive our thanks. <laughs> now, I will take only slight exception. I am sure that there are students at Sumner who will give you a run for your money, too. <laughs> and, you know, you don't think so. hey, and the point is, at Ward also, at Washington, 
at Harmon, we want all of our citizens at that level to be um, <laughs> informed. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chief Siegler, but this video can be made available to community groups, true? Yes. Church groups, yes. any group that, that contacts you. Um, they can receive this video, a copy of the video, right? We will, we will have, uh, we'll make copies of it and make it available through livable neighborhoods so that the community leaders that come to that meeting will be able to take it back and share as well. Okay, all sure. right. And also, thank you again for these handouts. It is imperative that people have something that they can refer to. Um, the chief and uh, the mayor and the staff have made these handouts available. I think they are in, copies are in the agenda boxes here. So what I, I would encourage everyone before they leave tonight to take this home, uh, duplicate it, share it with your family members. Um, so I appreciate that. I would like to take this opportunity also to make an appeal to the citizens here. And it goes back to what Chief Davenport, Assistant Chief Davenport mentioned earlier with citizen cooperation. We expect our officers uh, to be respectful of us. Uh, we as citizens have, have a duty to be respectful to them, not to misrepresent um, who we are or what, what we may be asked. You're better off just being silent. Uh, you have a right to do that. But in some cases, silence is not helpful to our community. So I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to encourage, plead, beg, conjole those of us in the community who may know the identity and are willing to come forward and testify about the murder of the young uh, angel, Nicole, who was killed in our community about 10 years ago. From all accounts, she was a beautiful young lady, active in her school, a praise dancer, had fantastic hopes and dreams that will now not be fulfilled. There should be no safe harbor for dream killers in our community. So, so again, I, I beg those people who have knowledge and are willing to come forward and testify there have been any number of calls to the police department, but without the person being willing to make a statement and give testimony, that case and others like it will go nowhere. So this is our responsibility as community leaders um, and citizens of the community to come forward and tell what we know. We don't need to go to another candlelight visual. They have their place but they do not put dream killers behind bars where they need to be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much to our, uh, to our police and our, um, our young actors and actress. Um, appreciate all your work. Great job. One more. All right. That brings us now to... Um, our consent agenda, this is a non-planning consent agenda. The items are before us. Um, if anyone in the public or on the dais would like to set an item aside, please step forward to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and, and state the item you would like set aside. Anything not set aside will be voted on in one vote um, in keeping with the recommendation of the standing committee. Move to approve all items on the consent agenda. Second. Let the record show there's no one coming forward to remove an item. It is properly moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. The vote is 7 to 0. That motion carries. That brings us now to the administrator's agenda. Item number one is a resolution authorizing distribution of District 3 sales tax funds. I'll ask Doug Bach to make comment. Thank you, Mayor Commission. Um, this is really the evolution of the District 3 sales tax fund. It was originally initiated back in 1987. Uh, there was a pot of money that was distributed to each commission district. This is one commission district that still, still has funding that's left in this account. Um, it's been brought forward 
several different times where we've gone through and made distribution changes from RDA to ANDA to ABC as the community groups in the area as to how they can expend it. Uh, we've gone from funding mechanisms where it started where it was a small business loan type program to being done for housing or infrastructure programs. Um, as you can see on the RFA that was submitted for this, it was last amended on January 17th, about a year ago, um, or I guess of 2013. Um, in going through this, the commissioner in the district is looking for some flexibility on other ways to support other types of community events as there's still uh, about $17,000 left in this account. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Seeing no comment, roll call. Roll call McKiernan. Aye. Mugia. Aye. Markley. Aye. Walters. Philbrook. Aye. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. The vote is seven to zero. That motion carries. Item number two is a resolution updating precincts. Uh, this is an item, the precincts have already been changed, but our resolution identifying them simply needs to be updated to match the change. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly administrative role. Move to approve. Second. We could do a presentation on it, but it's, um, it's been properly moved and seconded. And roll call. Roll call, McKiernan. Aye. Mugia. Aye. Markley. Aye. Walters. Aye. Philbrook. Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. The vote is 7 to 0. That motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Newby has um, done a great job uh, coordinating this. Obviously, with population shifts, things need to be renumbered and renamed, and he's already used these um, in the fall elections. And so this helped. Again, it's just administrative to make sure that our commission districts are defined by the same numbers that are being used now in our ordinances. So um, we wanted to get that done before the spring elections, but people have already been using these new numbers in the fall, so it's not gonna make any, it's not gonna make any big difference for the community. We just wanted to, it just requires an official vote. So thank you, Mr. Newby, for your work and an outstanding and brief presentation. <laughs> All right. Item number three is an ordinance for digital outdoor advertising. This is a holdover from our planning and zoning meeting, and we'll ask the clerk who is required by law to read our planning and zoning statement. As the next item is a planning and zoning item held over from the last planning and zoning meeting, the following statement must be read. All persons for or against this item will be given the opportunity to express their views. Since it's the first time that this item has been considered by this commission, the commission has three options. Number one, it can approve the recommendation by the planning commission with six votes. Number two, it can override the planning commission's recommendation, but it would take eight votes to override. And number three, it can return the matter to the planning commission for further consideration together with the statement specifying the reasons for the referral back to the planning commission. Anyone for or against this item will be allowed the maximum five minutes to state your views. As you come to the microphone, please state your name and address for the record. The mayor and commission are required to disclose contacts with proponents or opponents on an item on the planning and zoning agenda. I will ask if any members of the commission wishes to disclose any contact with proponents or opponents on this item. <laughs> Commissioner Walker, do you have any contact? I've uh, <laughs> I've had extensive contact with uh, both uh, at least two of the major businesses involved in digital billboards, Lamar and their representatives, and CBS. Thank you. Any other disclosures? I don't see any further, so we are ready for presentation. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. Bach. For your consideration tonight are amendments to the sign code and to the occupation tax code. I have just a short PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, first, what these proposed changes would do would allow for the conversion of existing static outdoor advertising signs to digital signs. Uh, 
Um, this would not apply to any signs built uh, in the future, only those existing presently. Uh, the second and one of the, one of the most important aspects of this ordinance is that it requires sign companies to remove twice the square footage of existing static boards if they want to convert a sign to digital. So what this would mean in practice is that if a sign company wanted to convert a 600 square foot board, they would have to take down 1,200 square feet of existing signs in Kansas City, Kansas. So what this, uh, these amendments would do would actually result in a net reduction of advertising signs in our community. Each sign company would be limited to five digital signs in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and there are really only two companies, Lamar and CBS Advertising, uh, that would be interested in um, doing this. So we're, we'd be looking at you know, a maximum of 10 boards in our community. Converting a static sign to digital would not require a special use permit. The planning director would issue a sign permit after certification that certain requirements are met. Uh, among those requirements, the sign companies must identify the location and the square footage of the signs to be taken down. The sign companies must submit documents from an engineer that show that what st structural changes will be made uh, to support the increased weight. Uh, these, the conversion to digital can add many thousands of pounds to the signs, and so extra bracing and, and structural supports are required to be made. Um, finally, as an uh, incentive for the uh, sign companies to actually take down the, uh, the boards, uh, they must submit an affidavit within 30 days certifying that that has been done or otherwise face a $1,000 a day fine. The changes establish uh, performance standards to digital signs. The signs cannot display any movement or flashing, no type of animation or anything like that. It just has to be one static message at a time. The messages must be displayed for a minimum of eight seconds before going on to the next advertisement. Message changes must occur instantaneously. There can be no special effects such as dissolves or um, any type of uh, effect from one advertisement to the next. The signs cannot exceed a maximum brightness level, and that's defined as 0.3 foot candles above ambient light. Uh, for my research, that seems to be pretty much an industry standard in terms of the, the brightness level. Um, the signs must be equipped with um, a function that will allow them to go black or turn off if malfunction occurs. So the benefits of these proposed amendments, uh, first, for the city, old and blighted signs will be removed. Uh, it allows first responders to post public safety messages in real time, uh, such as tornado warnings and amber alerts that can be put up instantaneously if, uh, if we have information that needs to be sent out to the community. And of course, for sign companies, uh, benefits are that they can maximize revenue by advertising many different products on uh, one sign. Finally, the, the second two um, proposed amendments have to do uh, simply with amending the occupation tax code uh, if you were to approve uh, the digital uh, signs. Um, it simply adds a definition of digital outdoor advertising services and then provides for um, a tax of uh, $2,718 uh, for signs over 300, 680 for signs under 300. In reality, um, the sign companies are really only interested in converting signs uh, typically over 300 square feet, so that, that would be the, the main one that applies. Is that per month or per year? That is per year, Mayor. <laughs> um, I know that... If it was per month. Yeah. Um, I know that there are representatives from uh, both Lamar and CBS that would like to uh, uh, talk as well, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. I have a couple questions. One, a sign face does not mean front and back. If it's front and back, that's two sign faces? Correct. Okay. Um, and can you flip back a slide? Um, our emergency management would have access to these signs and could post warnings? Correct, yes. And I know 
and they can they can talk to this. But I know that the Amber Alert system is something that's uh, actually very important for the billboard companies, and they and they've discussed with us that they are uh, very willing to take part in that. And the Scout um, is it tied to the Scout system? I the, don't believe. That's something we can look into, I, I'm, but... I mean, that's my question. I know the emergency management has the ability to change the scout signs on the highways instantaneously. Oh, uh, no, we, we would need to contact the, the sign company. The sign company would need to do that for us. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Walker. Before we uh, invite the uh, uh, businesses up here, I, I wanted to give my fellow commissioners a, a little background in, and I'm going to say it was 10 years ago. It might have been longer or a little shorter. We had litigation uh, that involved the Unified Government uh, in an adversarial position to the signboard companies. And that lawsuit knocked around for quite a long time. And the genesis of this ordinance was an attempt to resolve that lawsuit. The proposal back then was that we would um, resolve the lawsuit and for every uh, digital board that was put up, a certain number of signs came down. The problem with ever reaching that resolution, um, as I recall, was that there is an imbalance in the ownership of the small signs and the large signs. I think we're going to find from the dialogue that uh, CBS uh, owns a lot of the little small boards that uh, are vacant a great a great deal of the time and have uh, an abundance of product to to trade to get one of these. Uh, I well it, from uh, conversations I've had. With Mr. Fessler of uh, Lamar, they don't have those kind of signboards, so their signboard trade would be perhaps uh, more economically disadvantageous to them. Giving up two good signboard faces to get one of these, perhaps, or however it would work. And there's history there, I'm told, that CBS has ended up with these boards. Um, not because they've owned them for 25 or 30 or some of them go back to when I was in high school, um, but that there was some kind of a uh, uh, industry litigation going on between all the major players and it ended up with swaps of boards occurring in that <coughs> some years ago CBS ended up with these boards. Now, they're here, they can correct me if that's wrong. My idea here was not to financially benefit one or the other. I w will tell you that every time I head south and pull up to 18th and Minnesota and I see that board right behind the bus stop, I just want to drive my truck into it and knock it down. It is god awful ugly and if, you know, to acquire these, it really gets me mad just thinking about that signboard. And I don't know why, it's just it's just, you know, particularly grading. It's not any worse than others in the community, but its location could not be worse at a major intersection in, a, in the urban area. And once in a while, there is something on there. Most of the time, it's just, you know, a sign of uh, a derelict area to me. And that is not a derelict area. So I have been working on this ordinance. It's been through a number of revisions. I I'm certainly willing to hear um, whatever pro or con that either of the businesses have. Um, but I don't see any other way, realistically or financially, for us to begin the process of removing these antiquated boards from our community short of, and, and we cannot condemn them under the state law because there has to be a public purpose for it. And I don't believe just because they look ugly constitutes a public purpose. So it's out there. I think this is a good way. You get rid of a number of these boards each time one of these digitals go up. I personally prefer digitals to the static boards. That's a matter of personal choice. Um, they are more in keeping with the technology of the day. 
So I have uh, worked with Patrick over uh, a number of months here to get this to this point. Now, the other two, um, the amount of the occupational tax will no doubt be under some scrutiny here by all parties. I felt like in instructing Patrick that uh, in what I wanted that a digital board because of the multiple faces probably has more re revenue potential. Of course it costs a great deal more to build the board in the first place so the return on investment is probably not as quick. But while I wanted an increase I think what was put out is one of those where, in all honesty, why bid against ourselves, set it high, and then perhaps negotiate it down. So I leave that to the commission discretion after hearing uh, the two businesses, and we will, or anybody else that wants to speak, and uh, um, we can decide on what the appropriate amount for the occupational tax is. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Waters, is it your, and I'll come to Commissioner McKeon in a moment, is it your opinion as you've been working on this that both sign companies are in agreement with this? No, no Mayor, I, I do understand um, specifically from uh, Lamar, as Commissioner Walker mentioned, uh, they have concerns about um, what type of boards they would have to trade for this and whether they would have enough um, boards to trade. And so, I mean, it's very difficult to write an ordinance that pleases all parties. Uh, you know, we've done our best on that, but um, you know, I'm, I'm sure each each uh, company has has uh, certain disagreements with parts. Thank you, Commissioner McKiernan. Thank you. Uh, you say here under the benefits that old and blighted signs will be removed from the city, and certainly that I think is a wonderful potential benefit of this. But this n ordinance change does not compel the old signs to be removed. Is that correct? That's correct, Commissioner. Uh, and it does not compel static signs to be turned digital? No. no. Then I can tell you one thing that I am going to be increasingly vigilant about is superstructures growing up on weed-filled, trash-filled lots. Superstructures that are rusted, aging, falling apart. Sign borders that are falling off of the superstructure. Signs that are blank for months at a time with no advertising on them except the old scrapings from old advertising. And I, do, I don't know who's here from CBS, but I do have to, to commend you, because when I called your office and complained specifically and gave them the board number, it was fixed in short order. So thank you for doing that. But I'm going to be much more aggressive in looking for these, because as Commissioner Walker said, it's pathetic that we have to look the signs, the advertisements themselves very often look really good, but they're on this old, rusted, decrepit superstructure that frankly is an eyesore in and of itself. And I don't think we should have to put up with those aged and unsightly superstructures in our community. So I'm hoping that even as we implement ordinance changes here, we can also be more vigilant about simply keeping track of and taking care of, and I suppose I should not be addressing this to you, but to whoever else is here from the sign companies, be more conscious, conscientious about taking care of those signs that do exist in our community, especially the older ones, which in many cases are here on the eastern end. Well, Commissioner, I want to be one step more aggressive than that. If and. Is it written? I mean, we need to make sure our ordinances specifically address the structures because if that weren't a problem, we wouldn't be bringing it up. I mean, these structures have been neglected. They've got tatterings on them hanging off from ads long gone, waiting for another ad to come by. Um, there's not any cleanup. The, they're, they are rusting and blighted. Um, and whatever property they're sitting on is often not mowed and filled with trash. So is there anything in this ordinance or in our current one that addresses the blight that these sign boards post in our community? Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, we've always had the ability um, to address that. I think it's, it's all, one, it's an issue of manpower and um, resources in, in tackling that. Um, from the unified government? From the unified government uh -huh. standpoint. Um, you know, that the cost and time of you know potentially taking because it would really require court action to you know 
take down, you know, to take it all the way. And so um, manpower, cost, time has always been, you know, something that's kind of held that back. And so this was seen as, as a, uh, alternative, uh, an alternative to that. Okay. Commissioner Merguia. So um, to the mayor and Commissioner McKiernan's comments, I completely agree wholeheartedly. Um, and I'm never going to miss this opportunity moving forward. I guess what um, where I differentiate the two is that to me sounds like not necessarily an ordinance that surrounds board bi billboards specifically, but it sounds like that is a code issue again. Nothing, whether it's billboards or a house or a vacant lot, should look old, beat up, and raggedy in our community. Now, if your comments about um, not having the um, uh, manpower or the personnel to address these kinds of issues, I, I just want a clarity um, made here. Are you saying we don't have the manpower to respond to Commissioner McKiernan's complaint about the look of billboards in his district? Um, or is responding not the issue? And is it the process that you need to take the billboard owner through to make sure that it gets done and cared for on a regular basis that we don't have the manpower for? I think, and this is coming from uh, comments that I've heard from staff, is um, simply that the the resources to um, you know identify all these boards, to keep track of them, um, to you know keep on the companies and follow through to uh, to make sure that you know they are all kept up and taken down. Um, that that's just a resource-intensive task, and for whatever reason in the past, uh, we just you know haven't been able to you know make sure that all these signs uh, stay up to code um, I, I really don't know and uh, you know those are comments from staff um, and not my personal direct knowledge so uh, you know I'm, I'm not sure where that's coming from so I won't belabor this but I will say I am really tired of that response I really think um, that we always get the same response there's not enough money and there's not enough manpower I need someone to show me how there's not enough money and enough manpower because I would think that if Commissioner McKiernan called in, I just think of several billboards on Central Avenue that are close to the ground and raggedy as he described with old advertisement hanging off the front of them flapping in the wind. Um, I don't even live in that area and I know exactly what he's talking about. Um, how, how do you not see that? How is that hard to drive down the street and while you're in your car doing other things not yourself if you can't write it down call it in and how does someone when you call it in what is not what is the person receiving the call so busy doing that they can't put the complaint in the computer I'm not trying to be funny I have been here eight years I don't understand what the problem is I, I, don't. I would say this is Mr. Waters is in the attorney's office I would turn this question to Mr. Bach um, instead of um, it's just a different it's not his department so mr. Bach do you want to make a statement in terms of the the challenges of code enforcement in terms of these billboards well I would say that you know we want to to raise it to say why can't we mark them over there I don't know that we've had a lot of people writing up billboards for some time I mean I can say that I've been here a number of years I know we've worked on the billboard ordinance yes okay. for a, for a long time and Commissioner Walker, when he was here as a, our chief counsel, you know, tried to work through this as he explained about different ways to take them down. This is probably the first discussion I've been involved with where we've had a, a code issue brought up about, you know, I mean, let's, let's go at it from that perspective, but I'm not in disagreement with it. And I would say that, you know, we could write it into it, but it's, I don't ever remember setting through a meeting where we said, you know, billboards are going to be on the top of our code list or, or really even on the code list so I mean we can go after it from that perspective and see what we can accomplish I think what Patrick um, conveyed is usually what ended up with them is that they're an odd animal but maybe that's a way that we can maybe we can make some progress that way and you know with both of the biggest owners in the room tonight you know I think they can hear the concerns that's coming from this governing body and I would hope would probably take steps to uh, move forward to clean them up on their own initiative without us having to go forward and try to push it from all different aspects of the law but we will certainly um, step up our game in that regard 
Commissioner McKiernan. I do need to clarify the last time the last time that I uh, did encounter a billboard that I really thought was pathetic. I called CBS directly and said, "Please fix your dang board." Um, so I did not call our codes office. I called them correctly, and as I said earlier, they 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 fixed it. I think we just need to be more proactive in making sure that I never need to make that call. Commissioner Walker. It's not on, sir. A anything that's been, I don't disagree with anything that's been said by any of the commissioners. Um, I also grow weary of the fact that we don't have the manpower. Truth is, we, we don't have the manpower in some areas because our resources are allocated to what we've determined to be our priorities. Um, I also believe that uh, um, if it comes down to enforcing ordinances against billboards versus uh, you know taking care of the neighborhoods and the houses and that's that's got to be our number one priority um, I uh, until that litigation occurred I'd probably been on the city 25 or 30 years and uh, I don't remember anybody on any elected body ever complaining about billboards only when somebody wanted to put up a new one at a particular location it doesn't make it right I'm just saying they have become a problem because they are I'm sure that when Wyandotte County went to 38th Street a billboard on one of our major thoroughfares was uh, a good way to advertise because there weren't any highways or, or, or interstates or or very few of them and so they reached a lot of people uh, the numbers aren't there I'm not an expert by any means but I I know that these signs I'm talking about are going to be placed along interstates and is that specified in the ordinance no but the money isn't on I, I can't imagine a street where a digital billboard in Wyandotte County could make them any money there's just not enough traffic or numbers now if there were and someday I hope there might be then we'll have to cross that bridge but you don't see them anywhere at least I've not seen them anywhere where I have traveled that they aren't on interstates or super highways or four-lane highways with big numbers of cars every day and I look every time I go out you know to the Speedway and there sits two in Edwardsville and one in Bonner Springs and I'm not particular I can't remember I know one of them advertised for one of our colleagues at one time um, and I was glad for that advertisement but uh, um, I would tell you that uh, you know the potential is to promote businesses in Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County with some of these boards. There is an economic benefit, indirect, that could further our interest just as much as the occupation tax. And I think they are more desirable to advertisers than little boards because you just don't reach anybody. They're a problem. This is one tool to get rid of them. You know, I've had this conversation with uh, one of the principals in the uh, uh, regional here for CBS. You know, enforcement of ordinances against them is fine. But again, I'm not in a position to say we have excessive numbers of people working code enforcement uh, that uh, are going to be available. Could they be more? I would say our code enforcement, in my experience, has been very good at being reactive you got a complaint if I pick up the phone and I've done that three or four times since I've been here called mr. talking and it was addressed this proactive we got a plan and this week we're gonna do billboards and next week we're gonna do um, you know old automobile stations and I don't know that we have that because we react and you know I would say to code enforcement to the extent that we have the resources available react to some of these signs you know make them want to get rid of them by putting up one of these digital boards thank you well I I appreciate the the angle of trying to eliminate the the local boards and I think Lamar would have an opportunity to um, buy some boards from CBS because there's enough boards that need to go to go around there's more than 10 that need to go um, I would be interested in having these having it specified that these digital could only be on interstates I think that would be a, a win you know I think 
right now it's not the technology is coming down in cost dramatically and I don't want to wake up one day and have one on a city street just because the cost is so low now and the revenue is so high if we could put those only on interstates that would be a big benefit for me the other thing and my only struggle and I think your strategy is right at the end of the day commissioner to try to leverage the digital to bring down the the crummy ones in the urban area and I and I support that and I, I support moving forward with this my only concern is the only hesitation I have the only thing that kind of gnaws at me is I do not like rewarding people who have not been good stewards with our city in letting their product be crappy unpainted falling down dilapidated a part of the blight and giving people who have been a part of the problem an avenue to make money and giving them an incentive we shouldn't have to incentivize good community partners to do the right thing and I would say these local billboards are a blight and a pox on our community um, and they have not been proactive or cared enough about our community to take care of it on their own and that we have to take a step of incentivizing them by baiting them with better billboards digital billboards in order to do the right thing irks me um, but if that's the way to, if that's the way to do it then that's it's worth trying right so and that's where we are but I want to send a clear message to the billboard companies and I don't know who owns whose I don't pay much attention to them you have done a disservice to Kansas City Kansas in the lack of maintenance and repair on your billboards in this city and it's an embarrassment and I think we do ramp up code enforcement and just let you know it is unacceptable that you don't care about our community at all you only care about the money you can make here and that's the kind of absentee landlord we do not need and I want to make that very clear that I don't have any patience for it so if we can add only on interstates that would make me feel better um, but uh, Commissioner Markley and then Merkia. Well, I was just going to ask a question related to the only on interstates. Does, this ordinance doesn't affect the zoning requirements that are in place. And so for the most part, I would think that that would impact where they were able to put a billboard. I mean, we're not saying you can put a billboard anywhere in, the ordin in this ordinance, correct. right? That, that's correct. Okay. And there are certain streets that we've already designated as off limits in the community, and those would remain. Just to be clear, I'm fine either way with adding the interstates or not. I just wanted to clarify whether we've made any cho change because I know currently zoning requirements handle that portion of it. Correct. Commissioner Merguia. I just add an additional comment, Mayor, to what you said. I think it's a very normal human reaction when, for example, billboards have been unkept and dilapidated and look terrible in our community and it's gone on for years to be so angry and rightfully so to say you know what we're gonna rid our city of all of them and we're never gonna let them back because we're mad about what's going on but the reality is as I'm scanning off of Google all the great images for urban electronic billboarding I'm thinking that's very cool what a missed opportunity I'm just saying let's not do a drive-by shooting so to speak um, with billboards just because we've had a bad history with them I say we we've, we've made it very clear what our position is my personal approach would be I support all the hard work Commissioner Walker's done on this I think he's meeting people where they're at now we are as at fault I think as the billboard people for not enforcing our own code enforcement ordinances which don't allow this kind and I know for a fact don't allow this kind of dilapidation in our community and they should have been enforced they didn't do it and we didn't do our job so Commissioner Walker's suggestion moving forward is fantastic. Okay, we both made mistakes. We're going to do make an attempt to clean it up. But I don't think eliminating big billboards on city streets is the answer. Now, I'm not saying they should just be allowed to put them up. There should be, um, if there's some sort of process that people can go through, like, um, and if that's through the variance process, I'm saying this out loud because I don't know the process. Um, I think that people should be able to bring that forward and say I think this is an exception and give the Commission the opportunity to review that exception because that's what's great about Wyandotte County is our county is very diverse some neighborhoods are very densely populated and walkable with a lot of urban busing transportation and then we have a much more rural rolling hill sort of scenic area like we do in Turner and then we have a more suburban setting like we do out west 
So not all the rules are going to fit each neighborhood the same way. So that's my caution. Um, I would just say I, I would like to at least see what people have to present and not make a rule that forbids that. All right, so now we do need to, I don't see any more questions from the uh, commission. We do have a public um, hearing as a part of the process. I will begin um, by opening up that public hearing. If there's anyone who would like to speak first, and in, uh, we've heard the presentation from our legal department. If you would like to speak in favor of this, I'd invite you to come forward to the podium at this time and state your name and address for the record. Anyone who'd like to speak in favor? Good evening. My name is David Hyatt. I'm with CBS Outdoor slash Outfront Media. We recently changed our name just in the last um, last three weeks. I want to say that I actually um, I want to thank um, Commissioner Walker and Patrick for putting so much work and effort into this. We've been working for a long time trying to come up with some way ever since the settlement of the occupational tax to to try to figure out a way to remove boards from the urban core. Um, I think it's a great way to do this. I just also wanted to say I hear your message loud and clear. We try to be good corporate citizens, um, and it's our intention if to do anything if this passes. You know, we try to try to remove most of the, the signs in order to certain areas. I know that there's certain areas of concern, but um, I don't have a whole lot to say. I just wanted to say that we're in support of this and thank everyone for their work and. If you have any other questions, like I said, we got your message in heaven. We heard that. So, would you be supportive of this ordinance only allowing them on interstates? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor at this time? Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, my name is Mitch Matz, and I'm with Outfront Media from Chicago. I'm the referred to corporate representative. Uh, I too have heard you loud and clear and I personally apologize for the condition that our inventory is in in this community. Um, I have for uh, no excuses whatsoever. Uh, I'd like to defer any comment to answer any questions that the board may have after any remonstration if that meets with the approval of the mayor and the commission. Just defer further comment until there's questions. That'd be fine. Thank you very much. And, I, and I too will support uh, the restriction to uh, interstate highways as well. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to step forward in favor of this ordinance at this time? Let the record show I see no one else coming forward. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this ordinance? Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Can you state your name and address, please? Yes. My name is Bob Fessler. I'm with Lamar Advertising. I am the Midwest Territory Manager based here in Kansas City. Um, is the commission open to seeing the short PowerPoint? Um, 20 maybe. Hey Liz, I'm going to ask Liz Ham, our real estate manager, to assist me here. Uh, Mayor Hall and commissioners, uh, staff members, um, once again, my name is Bob Fessler. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak about this. Uh, in contents, we are very much in favor of the swap of billboards for digital. Uh, Lamar operates almost 26 digitals in the Kansas City metro area. Uh, so in context, we really like the idea. Digital is where the future is going. Um, it's uh, a lot of cities are doing exactly what you all are sitting here looking at tonight. They're, they're looking at ways to eliminate uh, blighted old signs in exchange for uh, digital inventory. So we very much get that. Um, brief history, our company's been around since 1902. Uh, the same family still runs it, uh, based in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 85% of our revenue comes from local advertisers. I heard somebody earlier talk about that. Um, it's a big deal. We sell to people within the local area, and, and uh, we find that to be good. Uh, when digitals were allowed, back in uh, 2003 was when the wave of digitals first hit. Um, there was uh, a lot of talk, uh, a lot of how are we going to control these, what are we going to do. 
There were safety studies done. Uh, the Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech Transportation Institute uh, actually did one for the Federal Highway Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board. And somebody else mentioned, uh, I think it was Patrick, talked about uh, there's a lot of industry standards that have come about now that have, uh, they, they monitor lighting, they monitor dwell times, they, uh, brightness, everything. So um, just wanted to mention that very quickly. In 2007, the Federal Highway Administration um, actually put out a uh, letter or a statement saying that uh, digitals would be allowed on federal interstates. Uh, they talked about they wanted duration of message between four and ten seconds, transition time, meaning dwell time, one to two seconds, static message only, no animation, no flashing, no scrolling, no video, and that's pretty much what most of the cities have uh, come up with. Kansas in 2006, KDOT uh, uh, for the first time allowed digital signs. Um, they chose pretty much what you all are looking at. Uh, signs uh, must remain fixed for eight seconds. Dwell time must, uh, must be instantaneous within a second or two. Um, they had some language in there about spacing between existing uh, electronic signs. They have to be at least 1,000 feet apart on either side of the road. Just to give you an idea of what we're looking at, I heard some conversation about uh, it's in the code. Every sign that we build, we have it engineered, uh, checked. We use the same people that uh, Outfront uses. Um, this is a sign that happens to be uh, right at 670 in Genesee, just to kind of give you an idea what the structure might look like. This is another one that I believe is over on uh, Interstate 470. This is a listing of where our digital signs are currently, just to give you an idea of what, uh, what cities have uh, worked with us to allow digital signs. Um, uh, we have six in Kansas City, four in Edwardsville, two in Independence, two up north in North Kansas City, three in Lee Summit, two in St. Joe, one in Mission. Recently, we added one in Pleasant Valley, one in Northmore, and then one in uh, uh, unincorporated Jackson County. There was also conversation earlier about public service. Uh, Lamar was one of the first companies that uh, worked with uh, uh, missing and exploited children to, to allow Amber Alerts to be, they can, they can actually override our system. Um, they can, if there's an Amber Alert within so many miles of, of uh, our particular operating area, they can go in and <clears throat> override the system for up to three hours and put a, put a message up there. Uh, in the last two years, we've started working with um, uh, uh, FBI, uh, U.S. Marshals. Um, we're now working with FEMA. Uh, when, the, when the Joplin disaster happened, they were able to put messages up within in, pretty much within hours of where people could go to help, what, where volunteers could go, um, those kind of things. We also, in most of the areas where we put a digital sign up, um, <clears throat> we offer uh, advertising to the local governments. Um, they can put up good community service messages, uh, they can put up events, they can put up uh, something that, that might have happened. Um, I know you're working, go to the next one please. The Healthy Campus, um, you know, if there's a big announcement within the government, then there's an opportunity to utilize some space because I'd like to tell you that they're sold 100% of the time, but they're not. Here's the current lay of the land here in, in unified government. Um, we operate what's called the Junior Bulletin. It's 300 square feet. We have one of them. It's actually on I-70 at the BP, BPU property. And then we have 51 uh, bulletins, which equates to, how many structures, Liz? 20. I think it's 27 structures because uh, a lot of them are back to back. So we have 27 billboards. Every one of our signs is on an interstate. It's on either 635, 70, 670, or I-35. We have no signs off the interstate, every one of them. So all but two of my signs are the larger 14 by 48 structures. Um, somebody mentioned maintenance. I'm going to take a minute here just to jump in there. Within the last three months, every sign that we own in Wyandotte County <coughs> was completely sanded, scraped, painted, and that's an ongoing program with Lamar. Every five years, we redo every sign we have. We go out and we paint it. It's a Lamar brown color that we own and operate. Um, so all of our structures are updated. The other thing we've done in the last two years is we changed every single light fixture on our sign and reduced our power usage by 50%. We went to an energy efficient light. 
When they did that, they also went to a satellite control system where if a sign is not sold, we can turn it off via computer automatically rather than burning the lights for something that's, that's not being paid for or a message that's gone, gone uh, defunct. You'll notice there are three other companies. Uh, Port Lier has one structure on uh, Interstate 635. Adtran has one on 70, and then Wait has two structures, uh, one out on 70. I'm not sure, can't remember where the second one was. But um, five companies uh, out front has all 113 of the uh, poster inventory uh, within Wyandotte County. This is what was proposed um, when it was sent to us, was that um, the city, we understand where they're at. I I'm standing here in front of you, and this is kind of deja vu for me. Um, I went through this two years ago in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we got dragged in because Kansas City was going through the same thing you were. They were very unhappy with, with uh, the condition of, of uh, inner city billboards, posters, junior posters. Um, and consequently, they chose to shut the city down. Uh, but some of the regulations that came out of Kansas City, Missouri, I shared with Patrick and uh, Council, or, uh, Commissioner Walker, I think, that, I think that there is a way for you to put some controls in place. I do. I think there's a way for you to, to, uh, to put a little oomph into controls. Uh, the city, Kansas City, Missouri, started a registry where we have to number our boards. We have to give it to them. They do have one inspector. The inspector goes out quarterly, checks the billboards, um, reports back, and if there's a problem, you have a remediation period to fix the problem, um, and we all address that and we deal with it. And I can honestly say uh, uh, the, up, the upkeep of the billboards within Kansas City, Missouri has gotten better. It really has. So what we're, what we're dealing with is uh, the two for one on square footage. If you want to put a 14 by 48 sign up at 672 square feet, you're going to have to give up uh, twice that amount in order to get one digital. And this was a language that came out to reduce what otherwise might be confusing and objectionable clutter, enhance the harmony between residential and commercial uses. We made a proposal um, through staff and, and uh, Commissioner Walker that we felt uh, the reason I'm standing here, it's, it's kind of perplexing because uh, we, we are big digital proponents, but this particular ordinance is so one-sided that it's, it's just uh, part of my job is that I travel three states and deal with a lot of municipalities, um, and this is a big issue now. It's going on. Uh, I think Mr. Madsen's working on one in uh, Indianapolis, but you always have one company that's got the posters. Then you have, another, you have two or three companies that have the bulletins, and they're starting to look at weighted scales. And what I mean by that is that if you've got these posters uh, that, that are generating little or no revenue, and you've got this uh, 1448 structure out on the interstate that's generating revenue, and that structure is probably sometimes maybe 10 times the value to build, um, we offered up, listen, we'll do the two for one that you're asking for, even though I don't have that many signs to begin with. but if what you're really trying to achieve here is to eliminate some of these dilapidated signs, then why not address that? If, if you take that two and a half, to a two and a half or a three, and I'm still at two, it, and you'll see in a slide moving forward why I'm saying this, it, it seems that that's what you're trying to achieve, is that you want those signs that are unkept or unsightly or, or whatever you want to call them to be removed. We're in favor of that. We're just simply saying, Let's level the playing field here. If I go, we went out and we pretty much used the same company to do our maintenance and build our signs and whatever. If I take down a 1448 sign, for instance, 635 north of Kansas Avenue, I've got one over near the crane company there. That sign sits about 55 feet in the air and it's got a 1448 head on it. Structure's probably valued at about $80,000 brand new. That sign's going to cost me $25,000 just to remove it. To bring a crane in, drop the head, drop the pipe, dig out the foundation, it's going to cost me $25,000. If you take a poster down on average, a single pole poster, which is a 12 by 25 sign, which is less than half the size, you're looking at a dismantle cost of maybe $5,000. That's if you're renting a crane and not using your own people and all those kind of things. You get into these junior posters that are 6 by 12, 
and you start talking about sometimes they can be knocked down with you get a you get a torch and a couple of guys and you, you drop them to the ground because they're six by twelve. Show some. Do we have some pictures, Liz? This is a sign I was talking about. You can see the height, the size, the the the, the overall dynamics of it. And then we took some pictures of a couple of. This is a poster. Um, I think that was on Minnesota. I'm not sure. Um, that's a side by side poster that was built out of angle iron. Um, way lower to the ground and then this, this is a 6 by 12 sign. This is uh, one of the smaller ones that we've been talking about. So when you start talking economics and you start talking about the fair and equitable and, and, and those type of things, there, there's, some, there's some rationale here that I think needs to be addressed. And that, that's all we're saying is that a little tweaking to, to what we're talking about might be favorable. Um, There were a couple other things mentioned that I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, the, the, and the second proposal that, that we made within the last week was if you don't want to go to three to one on the posters, um, then back up the bus on the, on the bulletins. You know, the, the, the bulletins out on the interstate are not the problem, at least not what I've heard. Um, you know, those signs uh, have been there. We try, I'm not going to tell you we're perfect by any means. We try very hard. We have a staff of of 11 people in Kansas City that they do nothing but maintain our signs, put the advertising up, maintain the lights, and do the whole nine yards. Our company is very progressive in trying to, to, to do state-of-the-art things with the lighting, with, with the technology, with the vinyls, with everything, and that's why we have so many digitals is that we're, we're firm believers. We operate almost 2,200 digitals across the country now. Um, so it's hard for me to sit here and, and almost talk against <laughs> Getting, getting digital when in fact we very much want digital and we want to put it up and we want to use it and, and if we can somehow help the governments uh, so be it. Two last parting comments. Uh, uh, Commissioner Walker mentioned uh, several years ago and I was dead in the middle of this. Uh, I got here in 2000. In 2002 uh, we did a swap with CBS. Um, we're talking about the little signs that were mentioned. It didn't have anything to do with litigation. It, it was a pure play. CBS owned a bunch of highway signs in Nebraska. Lamar had two major offices in Nebraska. We had an office in Omaha. We had an office in Lincoln. CBS agreed to completely get out of the state of Nebraska. In return, we traded other inventory where they felt they would like to have inventory. So we traded our eight sheets at that time to them in order to pick up the inventory in Omaha and, and Lincoln. And that's how that kind of came about. Um, another thing that was mentioned is, uh, Mayor Holland, I think you mentioned it, seven years ago when the litigation was going on, that kind of derived from a, a, uh, this occupation tax is where it came about. And there was talk about, you know, drop the lawsuit, we'll, we'll, we'll do some swaps, we'll, we'll do some other things. And at that time it was mentioned, and it might have been by um, at Commissioner Walker uh, at that time, I think you were on a, you were legal. Um, why don't you buy some billboards from, from CBS? And that was discussed, and it never got anywhere. So I'm here tonight to simply say we're very much in favor of, of getting a program done. But let's do something that's fair and equitable to everybody. And I think I would ask any of you to go out and write our inventory. If you've got a problem, please let me know personally. We take pride in what we do. We try to make sure that we're, we're operating good signs, that our lights work, that the signs look good. And, and I would hope that we continue to operate that way. That's really all I got, unless you have any questions for me. Can you back up um, to your first proposal? Yeah. I think I'm going to. Am I going the right way? Let's see. Okay, so your proposal is... That was the original, yes. The original proposal is to scale the trades um, proportional to the size rather than two to one. And, and, and mainly, well, what I was trying... There were two things I was trying to achieve here. There was nowhere in the context of the ordinance, which there normally is, we have very definitive industry sizes. You know, a 1448, everybody knows that that is 672 square feet. 
a poster everybody knows is 242 square feet a junior poster is 72 square feet so what we were trying to do is identify for the UG when the trade value comes in understand what's being given to you as the currency for the exchange but we started with the three for one mainly mainly for, for the purpose of what I just talked about I didn't really get into it too much but there's probably about a differential of four to one between what a good poster would sell for and what a good bulletin would sell for so for every bulletin that I would have to take down I'm four times behind in what I'm giving up versus my competitor and then you tack on the value of the dismantle which is usually somewhere in the five to one range you know we looked at 25 versus five so we were trying to find a way to say two things number one from talking to Mr. Walker from talking to, to uh, Patrick it was clear to us in our representative Mr. Bowers uh, it was clear to us that the city was trying to eliminate blighted signs old signs dilapidated whatever you want to call them but somewhere I think the focus is it's not a level playing field that's the best way I can put it it's just not a level playing field and that's kind of where we're at all right Commissioner Walker and he is correct he is he's Mr. Fessler is correct in that the primary objective was the idea that in all likelihood uh, the marginal dilapidated uh, non-profitable or break-even boards would be the ones these uh, companies would would offer up overall the concept was not only will that eventually uh, say say it runs its course and we don't have any more that they've got to give up but because these multi multi-face digitals have become so much in demand by the advertising community eventually CBS and Lamar are going to have to give up some of these big bulletins in order to put up a new and thus you continue in theory I'm, and I'm, I'm certainly not in the business so I don't know that I'm I'm speaking truth here but the idea was every time you put one of these up you get at least twice the, the space taken down that means for my evaluation and maybe that's what the Commission wants to consider is is the profit and the cost of doing it but my evaluation was you you take down and at some point you've got them all gone all the bad ones but they still want and as you indicated the future of the industry is in this technology and so they're going to want to continue to put up digital boards and to do that they're going to have to start coughing up the big static boards because there's going to be no other way for them to do it unless some future commission changes the rules so ideally over time and perhaps in the short run not so much but over the long run the total number of billboards in our community would be lessened which I understood from many people to be a good objective now by lesser I mean units they'll be advertising six or eight businesses at a time so the actual numbers of advertising people or, or products or events or so forth may be increased their locations will not now maybe I've, I've got this all figured wrong it, it was more than just getting rid of the bad boards those will be the first ones to go can I interject one thing uh, that brought to mind just so you all understand if there's 123 or 132 posters out there in the marketplace and if you're going to do a two for one it's going to mean that the what we call a 30 sheet poster which is the 242 square foot sign that for every digital that they would put up they would only have to take six down so the total elimination would be 30 total billboard faces which is only 25 percent of the total yeah so go back to your count yep. I was thinking which way that was. Yeah. Was that up in the front or was it in the back? Back? Backwards? Okay. There it is. So the bulletins are the big ones. Correct. 
most and the junior bulletins are the very small ones. Now, a junior bulletin is a, it's a bulletin. It's not a poster. It's about the same size as a poster, but it's just operated differently. It doesn't have a frame. It doesn't have the, the type of things you see on a regular poster. So the posters are the mid-size ones. The po in, we got this from, uh, from the occupational tax department. They don't differentiate between a junior poster and a poster. So this 113 represents a combination of both 6 by 12s and 12 by 22 eights or whatever it is. So you've got a mix there, but what, all I was trying to specify is that if they just chose to do nothing but, but the, the 300 square foot approximately signs, they would, they would have to take down somewhere in the five to six range of those in order to get one digital, which means your total elimination of signs would not exceed 25 to 30. So you're looking at, uh, you're gonna eliminate maybe 25% of your signs. Following the math, I'll just be perfectly honest. Okay, so. I mean, I'm not saying he's wrong. I just, I'm not following in my head the math about the numbers of boards per each digit. each poster sign is 242 square feet so if you have to achieve twice 672 square feet that means you're going to have to come up with almost six 12 by 25 signs in order to get to the two for one conversion and if you're going to put up five digitals six times five gets you to 30. where, where did the number five come from that's what your maximum number of digital digitals, signs yeah that, that's up. a maximum you could put up as a company Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I do have a question for you, sir, Mr. Lamar. No. Sorry. Fessler. <laughs> Fessler. I, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you opposed to having the digitals only on interstates? I, I only have interstate signs, so yes, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. All right, so we have the proposal before us. There is, is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Let the record show I see no one else coming to the microphone for opposition. I will close the public hearing. Nope. I have a question of the other side. You can certainly ask questions. The commission is able to ask questions of anyone in the audience, um, but in terms of the public hearing, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing, um, and I will have... I simply want someone from... Uh, microphone, please. It is on. Uh, I'd like someone from... Out front to address the uh, uh, statistics on the swap and the face boards because I'll have to tell you um, I'm a slow learner but it would seem that if we were three to one we'd be better off and since you can only get five I want to get ready get rid of all of yours so uh, tell me how he's wrong or tell me why that's not a good idea He may be right, but he may be wrong, and I'm not an attorney. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that it's the goal of the commission, and I, and I may be wrong once again, to, to be billboard analysts and appraisers and run through mathematical formulas in order to balance scales of equality. What's equal is what's good for one party is good for another party, which is square footage in equal amounts. Now, I'll stand here as an officer of the company and tell you that we will remove 65 sign faces if you pass the ordinance that's in front of you tonight. Not five or six or maybe 10 or some imaginary number, the number of 65 sign faces. And that is conditioned upon five? That's the condition upon uh, uh, five, the, the maximum number of uh, a, approved uh, conversions by virtue of this amendment to the ordinance and what are we going to do with the other and I'm not going to say that all your boards are bad because I don't know we're going to clean them up that's half of them well I would certainly be very disappointed in not getting these boards either cleaned up or removed and the law we May pass here tonight can be amended and made much more difficult to operate under. I understand that. 
my goal really was to get rid of them where you don't take care of them. And I don't know what this real story is on the swap and why it all came about. I heard his version. I, I talked to David about his. And uh, um, I know that you didn't own all these poster boards for 25 years, and they've been in bad shape. And I'm 64 years old and have lived here most of my life. And I can't remember most of those boards ever looking good. So I don't know who owned them before or how many owners there have been, but clearly either the ownership bears some, re the ownership bears responsibility, but successive generations of code enforcement and commissioners and administrators uh, share that responsibility in a variety of ways. If we don't have enough people, shame on us, but we need to do our enforcement make them either take them down because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hurt them every time with, with citations if they don't maintain them I mean why is the old story no good deed goes in plenty, but guarantee <laughs> I guarantee you I think well, we're all I wanted to yeah. do here is get these bad boards out of here I wasn't trying to play I can't I don't have the mind for money if I did I wouldn't be sitting up here probably <laughs> I, I think we're headed, I will tell you this, I think we're headed in the right direction here. So um, let's hear it. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. I didn't have a question particularly for the proponents or opponents, but maybe Commissioner Walker or um, council. If someone, a company, individual, wants to put up one of these new digital signs, that they previously had nothing to trade off. Is that allowed under the ordinance? So I started a company, I don't want to go to the poster, the bulletin or any of that, I want to go straight to digital. Would that be provided for under this? Uh, no, a new company would have to find a way to gain some space, potentially buying old boards and, and then uh, re taking those down. So you would have to have in inventory um, to put up the uh, digital sign. So then the real, but to those who are existing, I heard an argument that as between maybe one of these two companies, there would be some disadvantage, but that ordinance would apply equally to those companies. Yes. Based on the square footage they may have to exchange, that could result in more or less in terms of the number. Correct. Okay. But someone who currently does not have footage to trade off, who is not in violation of being or of owning an unkept old board really couldn't come into the market currently. That's correct, and, and this only applies to existing boards, so, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Philbrook. You can come back to the microphone. I got, I've got questions for you. So, listening to all this, I want to applaud everybody for their hard work, but it sure does seem lopsided in how it's come out. What is, our, what is the total number of uh, signs we're looking at? Do we have a goal set for where we want to be? Because we're talking about eliminating signs overall. That's my first question. So where do we really want to be? You know, or do we just want to eliminate a certain amount of signs? I mean, what are we talking here? I are personally, I, I don't know a number in terms of, of a goal. Um, it, it would all depend on how many companies actually take advantage. And then the you said that that uh, this particular action, if we took it as presented, would not affect anybody new trying to come in, or it would. I uh, know what what I was addressing was that um, if a company currently does not have uh, static uh, boards within KCK, they would not be able to convert because you have to have inventory. Convert or or build. Sure. What about build a new one? Um, they would still have, they wouldn't be able to because they didn't, okay. I uh, know. Okay, I have a problem with that. Because then, that, then that's basically stopping us from letting other companies do business in our area. Sorry, guys, I know there's only so many of you, but still, I have a problem with that, being a capitalist somewhat myself. Um, the other thing is, is I really do believe that I understand why out front would be happy as heck with this, you know, because that would help slow down the competition, you know, with Lamar, and I can understand that. I, the way it's written right now, I, 
I can't support it. Uh, I think it just, there's just too many things hanging out there, and we're going to have to come back and revisit it again. I want to do something that I don't have to come back and look at in two or three years. Thank you. I, I think we're, I'm feeling the most optimistic I've felt about this billboards in a long time. I think we've we've got the right questions on the table and I think we are headed far down the right path and I think Commissioner Walker is to be commended for wading into this. This is sort of the the dogs of the advertising agent uh, world um, that it's <laughs> the, do the dog ordinance. What I mean by that we just finished we just finished a three-hour seminar on dog ordinances and they're very complicated and so that was my reference not that you all gentlemen are dogs naturally I apologize for that inference my my idea was it's it's a, it's tricky legislation that needs to be done right to be done fair and so I'm pleased that we've I'm, I'm optimistic because I see light at the end of the tunnel of 113 posters cutting into that number a lot so what I what I want to recommend um, today is to uh, table this for 30 days and for this reason to ask uh, Commissioner Walker has has been doing a great job and to ask the administrator to talk to both of the major players about development agreements in terms of how we move this forward and come up with maybe we do a negotiated settlement where we do more than five to get more posters down you know we do more for more for each but we do a negotiated settlement that's going to be fair to each of them and see if we can't come up with a plan that gets us closer to a hundred and I see 115 that would be great to go away um, now I'm not sure we're gonna get to all of them because there might be some that are in good shape that are generating revenue or in a place that's not offensive I'm not going to say all 113 of them are bad, um, but I would say we know which ones are bad, so let's get the maximum bang for the buck. We get one bite at this apple, and then we're, I, I don't want to come back to it either. <laughs> so we have a second for the motion. That was really a long motion with a speech before the second, so I appreciate your, your um, understanding that. But I would recommend that, and then we continue down this path. I think we're on the right path. And I think we, the digital signs are the wave of the future. I think that's okay. I really like the opportunity we have to move forward. So with that, is there any other discussion about tabling this for 30 more days and directing Commissioner <laughs> Walker <laughs> to continue this work for another couple days so we can get this right the first time? Well, I, 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 I would agree with that original motion. I, I thought it was directed towards Mr. Bach to sit down. It is, Mr. It is directed to me. With that, it is directed I, to I, Mr. Bach. I'm not going to sit with him again because I don't have the knowledge, the business knowledge, to argue with them about. <laughs> you know, they know their business. I, I think they're both on board with the concept, and there's got to be something that we can agree to that induces Lamar and is okay with out front and then they can go compete on the field of battle for the advertisers that's all I wanted in the first place was just to get rid of these old poster boards well stated so, uh, okay I'm okay with that uh, given that we'll we'll turn it over to mr. Bach he loves this kind of thing commission it's not a study <laughs> it's not a study and that's a good news Commissioner Merguia. I think it's a great motion. I would just say this. Now that they have a better understanding of what this collective commission wants to see happen, I'm not sure it's, it is a good use of Mr. Bach's time. I think they know what we want to see happen. I don't understand why they can't come back, take the, what's been drafted, work between the two of them, both bring it forward to standing committee, get unanimous approval then, put it on um, consent agenda, and let's not talk about it again. Okay. I don't disagree with Commissioner McGee. Um, you know, I also think probably there's other higher priorities that Doug ought to be working on for all of us. But he, he does have two it. capable assistants. Uh, my good friend Joe and <laughs> Gordon's over here. Gordon, my good friend Gordon, uh, and uh, 
I don't think that it is beyond their capacity to gather the troops together and work out an, a mutually acceptable final ordinance. But if Doug needs to be there, then uh, I, when I be when we assign it to Doug Bach, that's generically for Doug Bach to assign to whomever he sees fit. He doesn't have to personally do it, though he's welcome to. Um, we have an our attorney. We were trying to figure out if you were s s wanting to send it back, have it come back to this body, or go through a standing committee. It should go to planning commission as opposed to standing committee because that's the way it came up. It's the planning chapter. It's an amendment of the plan. Yes. That's what she, yeah, I think that's what she's saying. I think, any, I think any amendment of the planning code, which is chapter 27, has to go through the planning commission. Doesn't mean you couldn't go through standing committee and the planning I commission. I think we bring it directly back here. So if you want to bring it back to the full commission, then I have to ask you the next planning and zoning full commission, there's one on January 8th and one on January 29th. So when 29th. you say 30 days. It's January 29th, thank you. We have to specify the date, January 29th. Okay, Commissioner Townsend. Okay, my, my question was along the same line in terms of what the two or more parties are going to bring back is what? A mutually acceptable version of a new proposed ordinance? Because what we don't want to be lost Ideally. tonight is, is okay. The yeah, I don't want to lose the yeah. momentum. I, we're on the right track, and I'm as, I'm... I'm very optimistic here, so and I think we're on the right track. And the goal, as Commissioner Walker stated, is to get rid of the unsightly or to hold people accountable. That's the goal here. That's I wanted right. to be able to say we've reduced the number of billboards yes. in Wyandotte County. Drop the crime rate. Well, I want to drop the billboard rate. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Roll call. Roll call. And it's been Motion seconded, by, seconded McKiernan. by McKiernan. Right. Roll call. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Markley? Aye. Walters? Aye. Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. The most vote is 7 to 0. That motion carries. Mayor, I would like to thank uh, both Mr. Fessler and the representatives from out front for coming out tonight and being part of this it's 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 been an arduous discussion and fortunately I was able to shift it off onto Patrick for most of it but uh, I think Patrick's done an excellent job in in trying to deal with with the issues so uh, we'll get there guys somehow we'll get there well thank you I I think we're further down the path than we've been in a long time we have we are now adjourned as the Commission and we are readjourned reconvened I'm losing it easy we are reconvened as the land bank board of trustees item number one it's all consent um, both items are consent is anyone Move in the audience all items on consent agenda Second. or any commissioner like to withdraw anything let the record show people are milling about but not coming to withdraw things from the agenda Move. roll call roll call McKiernan aye Mugia aye Markley? Aye. Walters? Philbrook? Aye. Walker? Walker? <laughs> Townsend? Aye. The vote is 7 to 0. That motion carries. All right. We are adjourned. <laughs>